Good morning, saints of God. I'm Pastor Darrell Scott, senior pastor of the New Spirit Revival Center Church in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. More recently, the New Spirit Revival Center Church online. Listen, in the book of Revelations, the apostle John said, I was in New Spirit on the Lord's day. Oh, hold on, wait a minute. He didn't say I was in New Spirit. He said I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. But hey, you know, almost the same difference because the Spirit is in New Spirit. But listen, I've got a message for you today that I think would be a blessing to those who, once again, have an ear to hear and a heart to receive what thus saith the Lord. And the message details actually how when one walks in the steps that have been ordered for them by God, those steps are not always necessarily pleasant. They're not always uh, good. They're not always happy. Those steps can lead you through a lot of distress, turmoil, depression, gloom. Uh, antagonism, adversity, irritation. It can lead you through a lot of problems until you finally arrive at your place of purpose. In fact, the message is entitled, The Pathway to Purpose. So once again, have an ear to hear and a heart to receive. Get in the Spirit. Get with the Spirit. Let the Spirit get in and with you as well. And let's go have some good old-fashioned church this morning. Listen, we're absent from one another in the body, but we're still present with one another in the spirit. And we're going to hear what they'll say of the Lord. I guarantee you'll be blessed. And I'll see you right after the message. Let's read. And Joseph said unto his brethren, come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now, therefore, be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years has famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve your posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Psalm 105, the 16th verse. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He broke the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they'd hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. St. John, turn right. Chapter 9, verse 1. And as Jesus passed by, saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Final reading, St. John chapter 11. Beginning with the first verse down through the fourth, now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified Thereby, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard, therefore, that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Father, bless us this morning. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. A couple of weeks ago, I believe it was the week before last, I preached a message that I titled the path of purpose and it's centered around the life of Joseph. I'm going to continue in that theme on this morning. Say amen. amen. Continue in that theme on this morning. And we visited the third chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes, the first verse which states that there is an appointed time for every purpose under the heavens. And as we continue, or if you continue reading down through the um, first eight verses of the book of Ecclesiastes, 
you will observe that there's a series of 14 different contrasts that the writer of the book of Ecclesiastes embraces and he encompasses the entirety of human existence in those 14 different contrasts. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to sow, a time to reap, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a plan to laugh, a time to cry, or just a lot of different things. And he disclosed the fact, once again, that everything, every purpose has its time. Amen. Say amen. I tell you, I'm, at, I'm trying to chill a little bit. I'm having... And he was saying that things and actions, circumstances and situations have their time. Which then leads us, saints, to the understanding that everything is timed. Say timed. Everything is timed by an eternal decree which is above or outside of time. Everything is timed outside of time. An eternal decree, an eternal decision that transcends the boundary of the chronological sequence of events that we define as time. And we understand as well, saints, the fact that what divides past from future is the instant that we know of as now. Everybody say now. Now separates a past that cannot be changed from a future that is uncertain and is dependent upon current decisions and different choices and variables, amen. And the fact that God endowed us with free will, he's created us as free moral agents. God blessed us with the power of personal choice and blessed us with the attribute of independent rational thought, even though a lot of us think irrationally at times. It makes us responsible for the decisions that we make. It makes us responsible for the choices that we make, amen, so that we are free. We have the liberty and we have the license to pursue our purpose and also to decide whether or not to conform our will to the will of God. Understanding, saints, that God's will for our life is based upon God's wisdom concerning our life, which is why there is no intricate, there is no uniform, there is no detailed schematic will, there's no elaborate set of fixed blueprints for everybody to follow in the course of their life. We don't all have the same path that we take. We don't all have the same formula that we subscribe to because of the intricacies and nuances and the influences and the variables that are in our individual lives. Amen? Are you with me? I'm going to take my time. And in that context, God is an active participant with us in this evolving drama that we call life. How many of you view your life as an evolving drama? Purpose. Everybody say purpose. Amen. The word purpose implies looking towards the future. Amen. And as far as we can, are concerned, the future is uncertain. Amen. We really don't know what tomorrow holds. We don't know what tomorrow. We don't even know what's going to happen later on this evening. So that the attainment of our individual goals is actually a matter of conjecture. Amen. Uh, it's oftentimes a matter of speculation for us. Amen. We can we can. Say Say what we want to happen but that doesn't mean it is going to happen we can plan that we're going to do a certain thing like at six o'clock tonight we're going to dinner and at seven o'clock we're going to watch television and eight o'clock tonight i'm going to eat some popcorn we can but we don't exactly know because of the different variables and influences in our life we don't exactly know if that's precisely going to happen the way we want it to but for god it's different say amen because <laughs> while we can do no more than hope things in our life work out satisfactory, amen. God knows that his purpose is going to be accomplished, amen. And that underscores the concept of purpose as applied to God and as applied to ourselves because we can originate a purpose on our own. 
Amen. We can have a road paved with good intentions and we can endeavor to fulfill the purpose that we have carved out for ourselves. And it might or might not be fulfilled, but that's not the way it works with God. Amen. By virtue of his divinity, God possesses omniscience so that God does not begin with us and then work up to our purpose. Amen. He doesn't begin with us and end up at the purpose. He begins with the purpose and ends up with us. Are you with me? God does not work from person to purpose. God works from purpose to person. <clears throat> See, amen. Now, in referring back to the, some of my previous statements, I want to bring out the fact, saints, that there are different opinions concerning the omniscience of God. Amen. There are different theological concepts concerning God's um, omniscience, two of them being the idea of simple foreknowledge and the idea of middle knowledge. And those are two, even though there are a number of other uh, uh, definitions or uh, concepts concerning the omniscience of God, those are two main ones. Simple knowledge, simple foreknowledge sees God as a temporal. And everyone say atemporal, meaning that he stands outside of time and that he sees all points within time as if they were simultaneous to him. Eternity, amen, when you think of, uh, amen, uh, uh, simple for knowledge, eternity is likened to a parade, which those at ground level, amen, uh, uh, the, the elements of the parade come past in succession, but to one observing the parade from a higher vantage point, you're able to see the entire parade simultaneously, so that to an atemporal God, if you're looking at his foreknowledge as being as simple foreknowledge, there really is no past, present, or future. That's one way to look at it. Another way I can think of, I remember one time I was going to the airport. My wife and I had to go to the airport, and 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 and, and, and so we would go to the airport. And went up, uh, uh, four, went out 480 to the airport, and uh, went around and, and 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 get on the plane. And so when we begin to take off from the plane, I, I'm looking out the window and I could see the freeway underneath me. And I saw, I could see all the way up, I could see all the way back you know, going west from the vantage point, I could see going west, I'm back uh, uh, in, 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 in um, uh, back past Columbia Road and, 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 and back, back Crocker Park, but I could see all the way east up past Broadway and I could see, I could see from their vantage point that there was an accident right there and a bunch of police and, the, and there was a long car stalled going here but you know it got back from Broadway, the, it was a traffic jam but the folk back here by, 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 by West 130th didn't know what they were driving into but from where I was their future was my past. I could see where they were going before they even got there and I knew they were heading into a traffic jam. And if I could have warned them somehow, hey man, you better get off right there. And, uh, get, 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 get off right there because you're gonna go into a traffic jam. And, and some say that's how God sees things, that God sees all of eternity as a passing parade, amen. That's, that's simple for knowledge. Come on, say amen to me. But now the second conception is middle knowledge. And that's the one that I subscribe to, middle knowledge. And on the basis of middle knowledge, amen, even though simple for knowledge sounds more godly, you know, like this more sounds more like God. God knows everything that's going to happen before it even does. That sounds good. But the second conception is middle knowledge. On the basis of middle knowledge, middle knowledge says that God not only knows every possibility that could occur or every choice that could possibly be made and every probability it says and it says that God makes his decisions accordingly and brings to purpose his purpose to pass it's almost like a chess master who's playing chess that knows every possible move his opponent could make and is prepared for every move that he does make and see when you think of 
God in respect to mental knowledge, it does no violence to the concept of free will. It was indeed my choice. I could have made another choice, and it was made by my free will. I could have chosen otherwise, but whatever way I went or whatever choice I made, God was prepared for it, and God had already an answer to it or a way made for it. Amen. And so purpose always has to do. Purpose is always concerned with endings. Everyone say endings. Purpose is that for the sake of which a thing or a person exists. I'm going to take my time. I'm going to go for a while and then we'll get you there. However, purpose is also an ongoing discovery. And the fact that one possesses purpose, saints of God, does not exempt you from the hard work of discovering the full dimensions of your purpose on a daily basis. Because it's one thing to know or one thing to a sense or to be told by God that you do have a divine purpose. But it's another thing altogether to know exactly what the daily specifics of that purpose might be. It's one thing to know that you are purposed to be great. It's one thing to know that you are purposed to be successful. But it's another thing finding out what you have to go through in order to become great and successful. Come on, talk back to me somebody. Now, as I stated before, oftentimes the outworking or the working out of purpose is seen more clearly in hindsight. I have no problem saying that I'm a high, I, I prophesy more in hindsight than I do in foresight. A lot of people are able to look forward and say that is God, but I'm usually able to look back and say that was God. Come on, talk back to me. I went through some stuff in my life, but at the time I was going through it, you couldn't have told me that was God. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever been through some stuff? <laughs> I'll make it real plain. You ever been in a relationship that you thought was God? Then afterwards, you know it wasn't God? <laughs> Come on, say amen to me. You didn't think God was in that breakup, but now you realize God was in that breakup? Yeah, I see God more in hindsight. I'm able to look back on hard times and rough times and times when I thought the devil was at work and realized that it was really God at work. And so high, purpose is more recognized more distinctly in the backward look rather than it is the forward look or even the look at or the look around. Uh, Joseph didn't say God sent me here to preserve life until he was sitting on that throne. Uh, Joseph didn't say God sent me through this until he was out of it. Uh, he wasn't sitting down in that dungeon saying look at God. He wasn't in slavery saying oh God is moving in my life. Come on talk back to me. Because you have to understand there's a relationship between causality and purpose and meaning. These are terms that often overlap because in practical terms, saints, causation implies purpose. Causation, the cause implies purpose. And the purpose behind that which has been caused is what gives it meaning. So that the discovery of the purpose of God for your life, the pursuit of God's purpose becomes the source of the meaning of your life. The discovery, the pursuit, the accomplishment of God's purpose in one's life is what infuses one's life with meaning and is what gives the events and the occurrences of one's life significance. Past events of your life gain significance when you reach your purpose. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. My, my, my purpose doesn't change the facts of my past, but my purpose does change the meaning of my past. I thought was I, what I was going through meant one thing until I got to where God was taking me and I realized that it meant something else. Talk back to me again. But you also have to understand, and I'm telling you it's going to take me a little while, that purpose and meaning are not only experienced saints when one's life is good. Purpose and meaning are often been experienced when your life is bad or when your life is rough. We begin to associate purpose with time. However, we make the mistake of making the association within the context of chronology rather than in the context of procedure. Come on, talk to me. Yeah, and of appointment. In other words, we concern ourselves with purpose connected to time rather than purpose connected with timing. Uh, we as finite beings, saints, are not always able to 
penetrate into the meaning of this timing. For us, it's a mystery and it can lead to a great deal of frustration if we meditate upon it improperly. So then, after emphasizing that everything is timed by an insurmountable purpose, see, Abraham was worried about time. I'm getting older, but God was worried about what God was concerned with timing. I'm going to give you this blessing when the timing is right. And so in Ecclesiastes 3, 1, the writer exclude us from acting at the, at the right and not at the wrong moment. The fact that God has timed this doesn't mean that, that, that we're excluded from uh, responsibility. Uh, nor does it mean that any activity or behavior on our part has no bearing on our outcome. What we are to do is sink the chronology of our time with the appointment of God's timing in order, saints of God, to realize God's purpose for our life. I'm still laying the foundation now. In the Hebrew construct of Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, the words everything refer especially to saints of God, the movement and the activity of people and to what concerns them. The word purpose in its original construct means delight or pleasure. However, in the later Hebrew, the word purpose came to signify business, or more precisely, it came to signify destiny. And what the writer was saying was that in the affairs of man, God, through divine providence or divine superintendence, God arranges the moment when everything shall happen, and he arranges the duration of its operation. In other words, I'll make it plainer in the layman's terms. God does decides what you go through and God decides how long you go through it as you endeavor to fulfill his purpose for your life. And the writer is stating in no uncertain terms, saints, the success and happiness and prosperity are not in the hands of man, but that they are distributed at the will of God. That God is the divine coordinator of an individual's life. That God prescribes a course. God purposes a direction for one to walk in. And if that direction is followed, the end result will be the purpose of God for your life to be manifest in your life. I'm getting a little warmer. We'll be all right, I promise. I'm trying to save my voice. In the gospel of Mark, the first chapter, the 15th verse, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled field and the kingdom of God is at hand. And this causes us to understand the fact, saints of God, that there come periods in our lives, moments in our lives, when God's timing breaks into human time, when God's timing interrupts the course of our time, when something out of eternity comes into our time and gives eternal significance to that which is transpiring during the time of the interruption. So that when the moment passes, when the time passes, that which is eternal, the eternal purpose, eternal significance, and eternal reward still remains. Through our timing, God elevates the time of travail into a time of fulfillment. He elevates our time of trouble into a time of blessings. What is significant to note, saints of God, is that the direction God prescribes for us, and this is the part we don't like. See, I'm not going to sit up here and act like I like everything God does. Even though I know everything God does is good, I still don't like everything that God does. Because the direction God provides for us, the direction he prescribes, is more often than not right through the path of suffering, the path of hardship, the path path of trouble. However, most believers, we search in vain for any purpose in the suffering that we're called upon to bear. We can't find any reason for it. And if you ever been through some stuff that you couldn't find a reason why you were going through it, I didn't do nothing. Why am I going through it? I, I, I was fine. I was all right. I, I did the right thing. We ask ourselves. And if you ever ask yourself, why do I 
I have to suffer uh, the way that I'm suffering? Uh, why do I have to go through uh, what I'm going through? Uh, they'll cry out to God. Uh, they'll wonder or they'll go in anger. Or there's some of us will just simply bear the load in silence. But oftentimes we fail to discern uh, during the process uh, that the purpose of God uh, through the process of discomfort uh, always results in multiplied blessings uh, in and upon the life of those of us who endure the process to the end. You've got to realize, saints of God, that the manifestation of God's purpose in our life is a spiritual matter. The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil, which leads to the conclusion that the manifestation of purpose will always result in the destruction of the works of the devil in our life. Life. Somebody shout. The patriarch Job, we read about him. The patience of Job. He was unconscious of the fact that he was being used by God. He didn't know God was using him as an object lesson to generations. He's ignorant of the... He's a classic example of believers who find yourself in a spiritual battle. He was in a natural condition that had a spiritual origin. He didn't know the devil and God were contending over his life. He's the classic examples of believers who find ourselves in a spiritual confrontation that we have no knowledge of or we have no power over. A spiritual confrontation that manifests itself through physical opposition. Opposition that results in a great loss. He lost everything. He lost his kids. He lost his home. He lost his belongings. He lost his money. He lost his sheep. He lost his camel. He lost his goats. He lost his health. He lost everything in this trial that was connected to his purpose. But in the midst of the book that bears his name, in the, he's in the midst of spiritual conflict. It manifests in the natural realm. He's unaware of the details in the conflict. He could not look into the spirit realm. He couldn't read in a book. Help me, Holy Ghost, that the sons of God appeared before him and that Satan came among them and God asked him where he was going and he said I'm in the earth looking for somebody to ruin and he said have you considered my servant Job he didn't know anything about that he didn't know anything about whatever it was that instigated his struggle he couldn't look behind the scenes as to the source of his struggle he simply had to go through it and touch somebody next to him and tell him there are some things that you simply have to go through you've got to go through it things that you don't understand why you have to go through or how long they're going to last you just have to go through it in order to realize your purpose and in these instances you have to say like Job said he said forget it all the days of my appointed time all the days of my hard service all the days of this test all the days of this trouble all the days of this trial I'm just going to have to wait until my change comes though he slay me yet will I trust him because I know that my redeemer I know that my deliverer I know that my way maker I know that my need meter I know that my body healer I know that my bill payer lives and he's gonna bring me out when it's time for me to come out look at somebody and say I'm coming out when it's time for me to come out. I stated in times past, uh, years ago I stated, and I reiterate on this morning, the fact that when God gives you a word, that's why, you know, often I, I've never been one of those ones hungry for a word. If I get one, I get it. And I appreciate it, but I don't always go looking. Because sometimes when you go looking, you don't hear what you want to hear. When God gives you a word, whether it's by dream or by vision or prophecy or revelation in a witness or even an audible voice, if you get one, the word that God gives you will oftentimes disregard or overlook your present circumstance or situation. 
Oftentimes, you'll get a word, and that word will totally ignore your issue or your problem or your predicament. It will not speak of what currently is. When you get a word, oftentimes, it will speak of what is to come. Things that appear to be totally contrary to your present condition in life. God will speak irrespective of any negativity or adversity that is presently predominant in your life, and he will speak to you of a purpose that seems impossible for you to fulfill because God very rarely speaks of problems. He primarily speaks of purpose. And when that, that when, when it makes it appear as if God is unconcerned or God is unsympathetic about the circumstance that you're currently in, no matter how bad your circumstance may be, that's why when the disciples Jesus spoke a word, but the word that he spoke did not solve the problem. The word that he spoke address the purpose he said this sickness is not unto death but when he spoke this he spoke it knowing that Lazarus was indeed going to die but he was relieving death of its finality by the usage of his word unto and he was relating purpose to meaning and cause by stating that the purpose of the sickness was so that the glory of the Lord would be revealed the sickness and all of his discomfort he allowed Lazarus the friend that he loved to get sicker and sicker and sicker he allowed Lazarus the friend that he loved to suffer from the symptoms of his sickness so much so that his, it caused the sickness it caused him to get weaker and weaker and weaker and Jesus knew he's getting fainter and fainter and fainter but Jesus loved him to the point it caused his vital organs to stop functioning. His liver shut down. His kidneys shut down. His lungs shut down. His heart stopped. Despite the fact that Jesus loved him, he allowed rigor mortis to set in. He allowed his body to be wrapped in bandages. He allowed him to be placed in a tomb and he sat there for four days. Despite the fact that Jesus loved him, he ignored Lazarus' problem but instead spoke about Lazarus' problem purpose which was to bring glory to almighty God let me tell you something saints when you can bring glory to God in the midst of your problem in the midst of your pain in the midst of your distress you can expect God to call you forth and call you back like he did for Lazarus because then your purpose would have been fulfilled show glory right there Lazarus' purpose was to glorify God that through his problem because the Bible says many people believed in Jesus after seeing what he did about Lazarus' situation and when he seemed unconcerned about Lazarus' problem he focused his attention and spoke a word about Lazarus' purpose instead because he knew that if Lazarus fulfilled his purpose it would automatically take care of his problem. Come on, talk back to me. Too many people today want God to do something about their problems when God desires to do something about your purpose. Because God knows that if he manifests his purpose in your life, your problem will be eliminated out of your life. Shout about it. Jesus concerned himself more with purpose than he did with problems. When they asked him whose sin caused this man to be born blind, here's this man blind from birth. And they say, well, who sinned? They're thinking of the concept of resurrection because if he was blind, or, or not resurrection, uh, uh, what is that, what is that, what is that? What is that when somebody keeps coming back over and over again? Reincarnation. Some of them believe in reincarnation. They're like, if the man is born blind, well, how could the man sin? So they're saying he must have sinned in a past life. Either that man sinned, somebody sinned in order for him to be in this shape. Jesus said, neither one of them sinned. He didn't sin, they didn't sin. The purpose of his blindness is so that the works of God can be made manifest. So in the relativity between 
causation, meaning and purpose. Your problems have a purpose that gives meaning to your problems. The Bible says of Joseph, and we read, that until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord challenged him. But the word that challenged him was the word of his purpose. The word that he received in a dream years earlier. So then watch this, and I'm going to bless some of y'all. The purpose of his problems was for the fulfillment of his purpose. They don't get it. I'll make it plain. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, say, your problems have a purpose. And your purpose gives meaning to your problems. The purpose of your problems is the fulfillment of your purpose. That's why you have to go through what you go through so that God can do for you what he has purpose to do. That's why God doesn't speak concerning your problems. Because when you fulfill your purpose, your problem will have fulfilled its purpose. I'm going to make it plainer. See, you have an eternal purpose. Your problems have a temporal purpose. Your problem, your purpose does not end when your life ends. Your purpose has eternal benefits, eternal rewards, eternal ramifications and consequences. He will bless you to a thousand generations. He will increase you more and more, you and your children. But watch this. Once your problem has fulfilled its purpose, it's designed to dissipate because it no longer has a reason to exist. I'll make it plainer. Once Joseph's pit served the purpose of sending Joseph into slavery, the pit had no more significance in his life. Once his slavery served its purpose of escorting Joseph to the house of Potiphar, it had no more reason to exist in his life. Once Potiphar's house served the purpose of delivering Joseph to the prison, its effect on his life dissipated. And once his prison served the purpose of ushering Joseph into Pharaoh's palace, its influence over Joseph's life was over. What am I saying? Saying, once your problem serves its purpose, there's no more reason for that problem to exist in your life anymore. That's why, de that's why death had to lose its hold on Lazarus. And that's why blindness had to lose its hold on that man because they served their purpose. And that's why your problem is going to lose its influence in your life as well because its purpose is about to be fulfilled. Somebody give him glory right there. Because of what they see, what they feel, what they hear, and what they think they know. Oblivious of the fact that God knows much more. Look at that person next to you and say, I know you think you know everything, but God knows so much more than we know. And God's working behind the scenes. He's orchestrating and choreographing. He's maneuvering and arranging. And many times in our lives, saints, when everything seems so bad, God is actually working it all together for our good. That's why the Bible says our light affliction, which is but for a moment. Look at somebody and say, what you're going to use is the most likely events and the most unlikely events to develop his purpose in your life. He uses the bad and and the good. He uses the positive and the negative. He uses the happy and the sad. He uses the ups and the downs to implement his purpose in your life. Can I come around the corner? The Bible says in the 68th Psalm, the writer wrote, God sets the solitary in families in order to bring out those that are bound. It means God called you he chose you. He picked you. He selected you. Out of your friends, out of your family, out of your circle of associates. And he did that in order to account. He could have chose anybody else. And he could have chose everybody else. But he chose you. Talk back to me. Don't you know how special that makes you? And he did it in order to accomplish his purpose in your life so that your life could accomplish his purpose.
And so God fulfills his purpose in and for your life so that he can fulfill his purpose by and through your life. Peter said in his first epistle, chapter 1, verse 2, I got about eight minutes. He said that he was elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Look at that person next to you and tell them, say, the reason you are here today is because God elected you to be here. I'm going to go a little bit deeper than I'm going to bring it in, I promise. When we talk about election, election is an act of choice whereby God picks an individual or God picks a group out of a larger company of people or a larger. God looks at a person and God chooses that person on the basis of what he knows that person can and will be in him. Which means that, means that every believer has been elected by God for a purpose. With God knowing all that they would do and all that they would be in actuality and in potentiality at the time of their calling. And even though God does not condone, nor does he overlook all of your doing and all of your being. And see, that's why he called Abraham knowing that he would fail with Hagar. That's why he called Moses knowing he would smite that rock. That's why he called David, knowing he would fail with Bathsheba. That's why he called Jacob, knowing they were to the fulfillment of the purpose. God starts at the purpose and works his way back to the call so that when he sees your mistakes and sees your failure and sees your issues and sees your struggle, that's why when he sees your distress, it does not cause God any alarm because he's already seen your end from your beginning. He already knows every possibility that can occur in your life. He already knows any choice that can be made. He already knows every variable. He already knows every possibility. And he makes his decision about you based on what he already knows in order to bring his purpose to pass, in order to bring glory to his name. Look at somebody and say, he already knows. He already knows what you will or will not do. He already knows knows what you might or might not do. Look at somebody say he already knows. He already knows how you're going to turn out. He already knows that you are going to make it. He already knows that you're going to get a breakthrough. He already knows you're going to get the victory. He already knows you're going to come out because he's seen your end from the beginning and he already knows what choices you'll make and that's why people can't judge you based on your present appearance and that's why your situation is not the way it appears to be and that's how everything is going to work together for good because God does not work from beginning to end God works from end to beginning God doesn't work from past to future God works from future to past and that's why your past can't hinder your purpose and that's why your purpose is not based on your past because to God my future is already past shout about and that's why my faith is now. Now faith is a present reality. And the reason God is a present help is because since my future is already past, then my present becomes irrelevant. So God's present help is based upon my future purpose. But since to God, my future purpose is already past, then my present problem has passed. Past tense, already past tense, been dealt with, past tense, but my future problem has been dealt with in the past tense, but it's been dealt with in my future. Because since my future is past to God, then everything that's going on right now has already been dealt with. Look at somebody say it's already been dealt with. It's already been taken care of. But it hasn't been dealt with in my past. It's already been dealt with in my future, in my purpose. God didn't start at that pit and work Joseph up to that palace. He started at that palace and worked his way back to the pit. He didn't start at the sheepfold and work David up to the kingdom. He started at the kingdom and worked his way back to the sheepfold. And that's why Joseph 
got his dream of the end from the beginning because in the mind of God, it was already done. God knows that the pit and the prison were not going to stop the palace. And he knows that your problems and your pain and your trouble won't stop your purpose. Because your problem has already been solved. It's already been fixed. Your problem has already been taken care of. But not in your past. But in God's past. But since your future is in God's past, in the mind of God, you're already where God desires you to go. And you're already doing what God wants you to do. And that's why even though the weapons may form, they will not be able to prosper. And that's why you're more than conquerors to him that loves you. Because in God's mind, you already are what God wants you to be. Samuel poured oil on David's head and anointed him. And that began the worst time of David's life. Once he anointed him, he went back to tending sheep. Next thing you know, he's fighting giants. He's getting spears thrown at him. He's hiding in caves. He got to act like he's crazy. But all the while he's doing that, God's looking at him and saying, that's the king of Israel right there. That's the king of Israel right there. He's hiding in a cave, but that's the king of Israel. He's both busted and disgusted, but that's the king of Israel. He's acting like he's crazy, but that's the king of Israel. Come on, talk back to me, somebody. In the mind of God, you're already where God desires you to go. And you're already doing what God desires you to do. In God's mind, you already are what God wants you to be. That's why in the mind of God, he has said, you're no longer Abram. You're now Abraham. You're now father of a multitude. When all you have right now is one baby out of wedlock. You're already, I see you as the father of the multitude. I see you prosperous when right now you don't have two nickels to rub together. In the mind of God, Israel was already in the promised land before they even left Egypt. In the mind of God, you already are where God purposed you to be. You're already doing what God purposed you to do. Now all you have to do is let his mind be in you. And you'll recognize and realize the fact that no matter how things might look right now, you're going to be all right. Because God will take your tomorrow. He'll take your tomorrow and put it in his yesterday. Which makes the problems that you face today a thing of the past. So it doesn't matter what you're going through right now. Because in the mind of God, the problem is solved. In the mind of God, the burdens removed. In the mind of God, the yokes destroyed. In the mind of God, the money's on the way. In the mind of God, the prayers answered. In the mind of God, the victory is won. In the mind of God, the sickness is healed. In the mind of God, the battle is over. And you can shout right now. You can praise right now. You can clap right now. You can give God an amen right now. Slip out of your seat before I stop. Touch three people and tell them, say what you're believing God for, it's already done. It's already done. It's already already done. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to sweat about it. You don't have to pace the floor at night. You don't have to worry yourself to death. It's already done. There are some things you went through seven years ago and you didn't think you'd be able to make it through. And here it is seven years later and you're glad you went through it.
You don't have to wait till, the, till you think the battle is over. You can shout right now. You can praise right now. You can give God glory right now. Somebody shout, somebody clap, somebody dance, somebody lift him up, somebody give him glory, somebody praise God. It's already done. The burden's been removed. The yoke's been destroyed because of the anointing, because of the purpose that is on your life. And you're going to be all right. his name. Come on, somebody say bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. I promise you when pastor delivers a word that's always on time. Somebody say on time. On time. On time. I just have one thing that I just want to share with you. The Lord told me to tell you don't judge anything before it's time. He said because I'm working on what you need that we have. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. What you need me to work on he said I'm working on it. You know what's funny? You know what's funny? You 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 you, you can remain standing. You know what's funny about about your life and about your existence? You don't see the hand of God when the problem arises, and you don't see the test, and you don't know why, and it doesn't make sense sometimes. But then when you get to the end of it or the middle, like to the middle to the end, somebody say the middle to the end, it starts to make sense. It starts to make sense, and it's sad for us. But it's good for God because we are going through it. And we wish that God would make a way out of nowhere. And we wish that God would just say, just let this be passed over. How many of you have ever said that? Well, maybe I'm just the only one. But there are some things that you go through that you had to go through it. Look at somebody and say, you had to go through it. And it doesn't always play itself out in clarity while you're going through what you're going through. But by the time you get to the finish line, somebody said, by the time I get to the finish line, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. Some of you are getting ready to make decisions. And I heard the Lord when I came in here this morning, some of you were getting ready to make decisions for your life and you were getting ready to take shortcuts. But I hear the Lord saying, don't take shortcuts because shortcuts have long detours. Just go ahead and go through it. Look at somebody and say, just go ahead and go through it. Because while you're going through it, you get exactly what was purposed for your life. You get exactly what God ordained for your life. Now, I know we all want to make each and every one of our issues be so valuable and just so, you know what, God, this is the reason why, well, why is this? I had to do, do this. Why? And the Lord said, what makes sense to you now didn't make sense to you back then. And what you could endure now, you couldn't endure back then. But guess what? It's for a purpose. It's for a plan. It's, there's a decision in the next 30 days that some of you are going to make. Say where you were, the next decision that you're going to make in the next 30 days. God says everything you went through is going to go back to what you had to go through. And God said it's going to give you the answer. And the answer is going to be yes and amen. I know I took a long road to get there. Because I'm summing up so many things that God's people have had to go through. Somebody raise your hand if you had to go through something. All of us. Now watch this. That does not mean because we had to go through all of what we had to go through that we all messed up. Look at somebody and say, excuse me, just because I'm going through something does not mean that I'm all messed up. How else was God 
going to get you into his perfect will unless he moved the obstacles out the way. I'm telling y'all in the next 30 days, y'all going to see such miraculous things happen on your behalf. Okay. I'm telling you that because it's true. It's true. And God said that if you would believe me, your next 30 days would be bliss. They would be wonderful. See, you don't know how to do that because you keep expecting something bad to happen. Tell somebody and tell them regardless of anything, my confession is this, that God is and well able to deliver me from anything I go through. Anything, anything. Pastor and I, when we go before God to say, well, Lord, what it is that you want us to minister? What it is, what is it, what is it? He said, it's always this. It's always what you've been through, what you're going to, or what you're getting ready to come out of. Always, every message. So that means he's taking care of my past, my present, and my future. Touch somebody and tell them, say, my future is looking good because I believe God. And if y'all would praise him just for 60 seconds, like you believe God. I didn't say praise him based on what you feel, like it look like. I said praise him because you know that he's well able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you may ask or think. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. be before you long. Look at somebody and say, I'm getting ready to live on top. Well, I pray that message was a blessing to you. In fact, you know what? I'm tired of saying, I pray and I hope and I wish that message bless you. I know that message was a blessing to those that had an ear to hear and a heart to receive. I know it blessed you. Amen. Because it blessed me just watching it as well. Listen, we're going to take this time right now and bless the Lord in a different way through the giving of our material gifts. We're going to pay our tithe. We're going to give the Lord our very best offering that we can give him on today. Always do your best that you can do for the Lord at that particular time. So go, let's all go to givelify.com, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y, and we're going to pay our tithes because we are Christians and that's what Christians do. We pay our tithe to support the ministry, to support the work to support the kingdom of God on this earth. And we give the Lord our very best offering. So I want you to take this time out. Go to giveify.com once again. Pay your tithe. The tithe is the tenth. The Bible says it is holy unto the Lord. God said if we pay our tithes, he'll open up heaven's windows and pour us our blessings. The Bible says when we pay our tithes here on earth, God receives them in heaven. The Bible says God gives seed to the sower and multiplies the seed sown. The Bible says give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. The Bible says God loves cheerful givers. So let's bless the Lord through the giving of our material gifts. We're going to sow financially into the kingdom of God, pay our tithe, and we're also going to give him because he told Israel, he said, y'all been holding back on me. You've been robbing me. They said, how? He said, in tithes and in offerings. So we want to give the Lord, not only to pay our tithe, we want to give the Lord our very best offering. And I want to set as a minimum seed today, our minimum seed as a special offering is $33. Three is the number of resurrection, restoration, and recovery. It's the divine number, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Spirit, Water, Blood. Amen. We want to give the Lord a $33 seed over and above our regular tithe and offering. It's a symbolic seed. It represents what we're believing God to do in our life, especially during this time of uh, distress in our country. Three, the number of resurrection, restoration, and recovery. Resurrection brings some things back to life. Restoration restores some things that have been lost to us. Recovery, let me get back what I've lost during this time. $33 seed. And I know those of you that are in agreement with this ministry, 
those of you that are in touch with the Spirit of the Lord will allow the Spirit to speak to you. Let me tell you something. The Spirit of the Lord will never inspire me or unction me to request something and then unction and inspire you to refuse the request if you have it in your capacity to meet the request. So pay a tithe. Give the Lord that $33 seed. Amen. If you don't have $33 to sow genuinely, then do your best and try to sow something with the three in it. So I pray once again that the message blessed you. And I pray that you be a blessing to the Lord in response. Always endeavor to seal the word with a seed. If God blessed you spiritually, then you need to bless him back materially. And we're going to see you again right after the message. God, right after this time, the message is over. Right after this, I'll see you soon. God bless you.